Godzilla is an icon of Japan, a towering behemoth embodying both the strengths and fears of a nation that has changed with the times. But what does the King of the Monsters mean when removed from his home country and its meaning? The distinct Japanese creation of Gojira was sought after by American studios wanting a blockbuster monster franchise of their own for decades. But after multiple near productions, Roland Emmerich and TriStar Pictures 1998 Godzilla not only disappointed American audiences, it enraged Toho studios and sent them on the path to creating the Millennium Era. But once this 2000s Gojira had come to a close, it was time for US studios to have another shot at importing the King of the Monsters. Soon, Gojira would cross the ocean and be reborn for a new audience in a series that owed as much to the films of the past as it did to the modern world of cinematic universes. As we've discussed, Godzilla has evolved across four distinct periods, Showa, Heisei, Millennium, and Reiwa. But there is another. An American era that sought to give the King of the Monsters a bigger budget and a vision completely removed from its Japanese roots. This is the Monsterverse, which began in 2014 and whose future is currently up in the air, so far encompassing four movies. This would be an American modernization focused on giant spectacle and an interconnected universe, all the while reinventing Godzilla and his fellow Titans, not Kaiju, as metaphors for global catastrophe. Here we'll explore the entirety of MonsterVerse Godzilla and his giant ape rival. From an early, more grounded approach designed to inspire awe but receiving a mixed reception, to a climactic title fight made possible by behind the scenes rights wrangling. Combined, these created a cinematic universe meant to capitalize on the worldwide appeal of a kaiju icon, while testing the meaning of a symbol removed from the country that gave it life. After six films released every year, Toho Studios' Millennium Era came to a close with the equally ambitious and financially disastrous Godzilla Final Wars in 2004. And despite the studio's ambitions to course correct their kaiju's public image after Roland Emmerich's American Godzilla in 1998, the somewhat financially and critically underwhelming reception to the Millennium Era put Gojira into deeper hibernation than ever. What followed was the single longest absence from the big screen that Gojira has ever had a full decade, beating the gap between the Showa and Heisei eras by one year. But as we've seen with every fallow period, there were a lot of people working to bring Goji back. While there was brief discussions of a Godzilla vs. Gamera crossover film, the man who was most determined to bring the king back was Yoshimitsubano, the director behind 1971's Godzilla vs. Heidera. The same director who had been banned from ever making another Godzilla movie by Toho producer Tomoyuki Tanaka after Heidera's debut, due to Tanaka believing he'd ruined the series with his wild and eco-conscious film. After decades away from the franchise, Bano had returned at the end of the millennium period with his own company, Advanced Audiovisual Productions. You see, Bano had thrived in documentaries while away from Godzilla, but had never given up hope on directing the kaiju again after his Hatera sequel hook was never fulfilled. Bano believed that the antidote to Godzilla's flagging success was a format that suited his giant scale. What Bano proposed was a film titled at various points as Godzilla 3D, Godzilla vs. Deathla to the Max, and Godzilla 3D to the Max. From those titles, you can probably guess that the movie would be in IMAX 3D format and focus on Goji fighting a new kaiju named Deathla, able to transform between locust swarm, mushrooms, and a giant monster. And as the two fight around the world, with Goji flying once again like in Bono's Heidera, Godzilla is empowered by singing children against an enemy that embodies world pollution, much like his sludgy predecessor. Because Toho had no further plans for Godzilla post-Final Wars, the studio decided to give the rights to Bono, but with two conditions. Bono would need to secure funding elsewhere and Toho would have to sign off on any story and kaiju designs. In theory, it would be a similar deal to their agreement with TriStar in the 90s, but with more control to prevent the frustrations they felt with Emmerich's movie. So from 2003 through 2010, Bono, who planned to direct and produce the film, alongside co-producers Brian Rogers and Kenji Okuhira, rewrote the film several times and entered into agreements with several different production companies. Each time, the story would change, the budget would fluctuate, and the 
start date would be pushed back, but no film was ever made. Eventually, Bono's search caught the attention of American studio Legendary Pictures, who wanted to start a new series of feature-length Godzilla movies instead of Bono's single short film. Renegotiations led to Bono and company returning the rights to Toho so that Legendary could reach an agreement to co-finance and distribute Godzilla's new movies for five years, starting in 2014. Now, with Toho once again letting Godzilla be reinterpreted overseas, it was time for the King of the Monsters to come ashore in the United States again. In 2010, Legendary officially announced their plans for a new Godzilla movie with director Gareth Edwards, then primarily known for his indie sci-fi film Monsters, and a script by David Callaham. To assure fans they wouldn't repeat TriStar's Iguana Meets Independence Day mistake, Thomas Tull, chairman and CEO of Legendary Pictures said, Our plans are to produce the Godzilla that we, as fans, would want to see. We intend to do justice to those essential elements that have allowed this character to remain as pop-culturally relevant for as long as it has. Three more writers were brought on board to rewrite Callahan's initial screenplay, including David S. Goyer, Max Borenstein, and Frank Darabont. While these would shift the story in different directions, having a young Marine and his father who had been affected by monsters decades prior was always at the center. Also, the seed of Bono's 3D screenplay that saw Godzilla traveling the world to fight a rival monster can be seen in the shape of Legendary's Godzilla reboot. The final film would be released by Legendary and Warner Brothers on May 16, 2014 and gross $529 million against its $160 million budget, with a positive reception by Toho and a solid showing in Japan. Although none of Legendary's MonsterVerse pictures would ever outgross the most popular Gojira movies in his home country, the performance was strong enough for the studio to greenlight a sequel, with Edwards initially attached to return, but soon leaving in favor of Star Wars Rogue One. As a film, Godzilla 2014 is looking to provide spectacle from a human perspective, with Edwards deciding that no camera should go where a camera couldn't realistically be. This means that the limitless potential of filming CGI creatures is grounded in a more realistic perspective tied to its human characters. However, it also means that Edwards' movie often withholds itself from viewers. The limited screen time of Godzilla himself and the pretty bland Mutos, who act as the film's villainous kaiju due to Legendary not having the rights to any other Toho creature besides Godzilla, were some of the biggest criticisms of the film. It's a movie that's not entirely sure what it wants to be, but always delivers on sheer magnitude and spectacle. Is this a conspiracy movie? A movie about family reconciliation? A global warming reckoning? It's all and none. And that's the issue here. We're never quite locked into the central driving idea of this movie. Edward's film also works to establish the new central metaphor and world for MonsterVerse Godzilla. While Gare Goji feeds off radiation, he's no longer a metaphor for the nuclear bomb or war. Instead, Godzilla is the avatar of nature, being both negatively affected by humanity's actions and reactively creating global disaster due to the imbalances they've made. Now, Godzilla and his city-destroying battles speak to the fear of global warming, pollution, and man-made disasters. Here, Godzilla's origin is most similar to the 1954 Gojira, an ancient species awoken by modern man's interference. But unlike the tragic tragedy of the Showa era debut, Godzilla is a prehistoric titan, thousands of years old, extremely powerful, and the natural ruler of the Earth. This distinction places him more into the late Showa era's vision, as Godzilla becomes the protector of the planet. But MonsterVerse Goji is an apex predator, treating the world as his territory and willing to fight anyone or anything that would challenge his reign. This outlook would inform the rest of the MonsterVerse that followed, with plans for the film that would become King of the Monsters bringing in Mothra, Rodan, and King Ghidorah for a supersized battle meant to address many viewers' complaints about the lack of fighting in the 2014 film. However, Legendary's Godzilla franchise would soon grow into the larger MonsterVerse, with the addition of another famous creature who had battled Goji 60 years before. The history and evolution of King Kong deserves its own entire retrospective, so I won't go too in-depth here, but Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shodzak's 1933 film is formative for the entirety of monster movies, with its then state-of-the-art effects meets natural history travelogue setting the standard for decades of movies that would inevitably lead to Ishiro Honda's Gojira. 
Its enormous popularity would lead to a sequel in the same year, several unauthorized Japanese films, Toho bringing in Kong to fight Godzilla in 1962 and then giving him his own film in 1967, a modernized remake by Dino De Laurentiis in 1976, and a very bad sequel a decade later, TV appearances, and a very, very long period piece remake by Peter Jackson in 2005. In the years after Jackson's remake, Universal Pictures intended to make a sequel that would be titled Skull Island, with Adam Wingard to direct. At the time, this post-King Kong sequel would have been co-distributed by Universal and Legendary, but have nothing to do with Godzilla. However, following the success of Godzilla in 2014, Legendary became intent on making a new Godzilla vs. Kong movie happen within the scope of a cinematic universe inspired by the success of Marvel Studios. To make it happen, Legendary broke their distribution deal with Universal Universal, moved Skull Island to Warner Brothers, dropped Jackson and Wingard from the project, and wrote a new version of what would become Kong Skull Island with Max Borenstein, he of Godzilla 2014, in the hopes of making the kaiju battle climax happen. Universal, happy to focus on their own dark universe, was willing to let the monkey go. Whoops. Soon, Jordan Vogt Roberts was brought on board to direct, who pitched moving the film from 1917 to the end of the Vietnam War to help differentiate it from past Kong movies. With the new direction came several new drafts by multiple writers and the debut of the film in 2017. Its success alongside ongoing production of Godzilla King of the Monsters paved the way for the movie that would be Godzilla vs. Kong. Out of all the MonsterVerse, there's one movie that shares the most DNA with Godzilla's Japanese roots, King of the Monsters. The film, released in 2019 and directed by Michael Doherty with a script by Doherty and Zack Shields, sees Godzilla battle the reawakened King Ghidorah and Rodan, with an emerging Mothra becoming a symbiotic ally to the hero. With the three arguably most famous supporting Godzilla characters in the film and Titan Response Department Monarch now using futuristic technology versus their ground military approach in the 2014 film, King of the Monsters is a more colorful and more action-focused film than its predecessor. The climate change allegories of the Titans are retained here, but the triumvirate of Goji, Ghidorah, and Mothra acts as a giant-sized extrapolation of the human conflict between a father, mother, and their young daughter. New elements like Monarch's giant flying fortress and signals that wake up dormant kaiju illustrate that the MonsterVerse has pushed into a much wilder, less realistic take. But like much of the Heisei era, King of the Monsters takes the kernel of real-world horror and blows it up into a more elemental display of power and aggression. KOTM also adds a dozen more titans to the universe, but none of them are classic Toho creatures and simply play as background elements of world building. However, despite Legendary pushing their cinematic universe in the marketing, the movie became the lowest grossing of the entire MonsterVerse, with a box office of $386 million against its $200 million budget. The financial disappointment wasn't enough to derail plans, but it did cause a delay in Godzilla vs. Kong. First pushed to November 20. 2020, and then again to March 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Godzilla vs. Kong, directed by Adam Wingard, returning after his scuttled plans for the original Skull Island, and written by Eric Pearson and Max Borenstein, acts as the climax to the MonsterVerse, pitting the two titans against one another in a battle for supremacy, with several characters returning and Monarch playing a central role like always, with even crazier technology at their disposal. As touchstones for their personalities, Wingard cited John McClane from Die Hard as Kong's tough but overwhelmed protagonist, and WWE wrestler The Undertaker as Godzilla's anti-hero inspiration, a dark, menacing figure who only appears when his rule is called into question. Which I guess in retrospect makes Kong also Shawn Michaels, and turns the late debuting Mechagodzilla into Kane, ripping off the door to their Hell in a Cell match and never quite living up to the success of his big brother. It's also much wilder in set pieces and hyper-colored in aesthetics. Each MonsterVerse movie moves further and further away from Edward's more grounded and somber opening film until Kong and Godzilla are battering each other in a neon Hong Kong night with a glowing axe and high-flying attacks. By the end of Godzilla vs. Kong, the two monsters have come to a truce, with Kong finding a new home in the hollow earth and a rare happy ending for the ape, and Godzilla off to rule his domain. 
At the moment, there are no official plans for the MonsterVerse to continue despite the climactic film being a big success in both theaters and HBO Max. That's because Legendary has reached the end of the terms of their contract with Toho. Will they extend the contract? Will the next MonsterVerse movie be focused on Kong? Right now, there's no details. But as most every attempt at a cinematic universe outside Marvel has failed, the MonsterVerse stands as one of the few successes. Godzilla has taken many different roles and changed personalities many times over the years as Toho has shifted from era to era. And the personality and purpose of MonsterVerse Godzilla is an amalgamation of several different eras. As the creators of these films sought to both make their own version of the King of the Monsters and pay tribute to the past through both character moments and easter eggs. MonsterVerse Godzilla is a true force of nature, an ancient titan that once ruled the earth and whose battles reshaped the world. Humanity's exploitation of natural resources reawakens these titans. First, the excavation that awakens the Mutos in Godzilla 2014, and later the Orca sonar device that unearths King Ghidorah, who in turn unleashes titans around the world. Only Godzilla acts as the enforcer of the natural order, but the battles that write that order bring down countless cities in the process. King of the Monsters is the biggest canvas on which that idea plays out, as the world is thrown into chaos because of Ghidorah. Unlike the tragic Shodai Goji, the heroic Soshingeki Goji, or the evil GMK Goji, Monster vs. Godzilla is beyond human morality as a walking force of nature. Of course, the biggest differentiator is that this American Godzilla is completely computer-generated, becoming the second ever Godzilla to be 100% CGI since Tristar's Iguanazilla. But unlike its predecessor, this Godzilla is designed to be more in line with the traditional Godzilla appearance, a hulking bipedal beast with atomic breath as his ultimate weapon. To go along with its ancient creature origins, MonsterVerse Godzilla is almost entirely devoid of ape-like attributes, and more of an amphibian beast. Gills on his neck, a broad, stocky body, crocodile-like skin, and crocodile profile file when swimming, and much smaller dorsal fins. Godzilla is also brought to life through motion capture, with TJ Storm being his dedicated actor for both 2014 and KOTM. The same goes for every other prominent monster, and when combined with cutting-edge digital effects, the personalities of every creature become very evident. With each successive movie, the MonsterVerse becomes more indebted to the Showa era, as characteristics, plot points, musical themes, roars, and personality traits from the initial series are woven into the films. However, Legendary and their filmmakers are constantly resisting Honda and company's influence as well. The Mutos of Edward's film are some of the blandest kaiju ever, and while Legendary didn't have the rights to other pre-existing monsters at the time, these feel like placeholders. Earlier drafts would have had Goji fighting the Anguirus-esque Rockmatol and the dragon-like Pterodactyl, with these two combined into the Mutos. Even their names are a placeholder as a military acronym for massive, unidentified terrestrial organism that is never changed. Eventually, the beasts of the MonsterVerse would be classified as Titans and the term Kaiju would never be used, possibly to stay differentiated from Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim. But when combined with Dr. Serizawa's naming of Gojira immediately changed to Godzilla without explanation, you see the MonsterVerse intent on Americanization of a Japanese cultural icon. Let them fight. Separating Goji entirely from his Japanese roots has a strange effect on the character. Yes, these movies homage the Toho series, with Ken Watanabe's Ishiro Serizawa playing tribute to both Godzilla's creator and the tragic figure at the center of the original Gojira, but Japan is almost entirely absent from these movies. Instead, the United States is front and center as the home of every protagonist and the stage for most battles. It's strange to have a famous figure imported with most of his defining characteristics, but none of his cultural reasons for being. When you take a look at the many movies that came before, you can see that the issues faced by Japan have given Gojira a reason for being and are often responsible for the best of the best. If Godzilla can no longer stand for Japan's fears, strengths, beliefs, or guilt, then what does he mean? Most strangely, the 2014 film redefines America's Pacific Ocean nuclear tests as being attacks designed to stop Godzilla. The recontextualization works in direct opposition to the real world truth of the United States' environmental destructiveness, and the grief that gave life to Ishiro Honda's original nuclear parable. 
So it's no surprise that while Japanese audiences and Toho themselves have been receptive to American Godzilla, these movies have never performed as well there as many of Japan's own Goji movies. Worldwide, Legendary's Godzilla has made hundreds and hundreds of millions more than the Toho productions that came before, which justifies the studio's massive budgets. But it's a discrepancy that highlights the cultural disconnect Legendary has created. Thankfully, these movies don't turn the beast into the embodiment of xenophobic fears pitting American military strength against foreign dangers. Instead, Godzilla is nature asserting itself over everything humans believed about themselves. But the result is that MonsterVerse Godzilla remains colder and more removed from the audience. Something to inspire awe, but not personal connection. The moments when a character comes face to face with Goji highlight humanity's smallness, not Godzilla's humanity. In retrospect, Kong is perhaps the true protagonist of the MonsterVerse, with the biggest character arc. He goes from being an orphan who loses his family and his home, to a reluctant world savior, to a friend of multiple human characters and the ruler of a new land. Meanwhile, Godzilla largely stands as an inscrutable force of nature, enforcing his rule and restoring natural balance to the world, with humanity caught in the crossfire. After four movies, the MonsterVerse highlights the positives and negatives of a cinematic universe. On one hand, letting each movie expand the lore and monsters helps successive films stack on top of each other without the need to re-explain everything. Legendary has also allowed their filmmakers far more freedom in their creative visions, with each movie having its own distinct style and not becoming visually and structurally homogenized like the MCU. On the other, the bagginess of these movies means that certain plot threads are drop between entries. What happened to the surviving characters of Skull Island? Where did all the titans from the end of KOTM go? Why is Sarazawa's son evil? While in-canon comic books have answered parts of these questions, the disconnect between movies can be confusing at first. Also, great creative decisions, like Bear McCreary's awesome score for King of the Monsters, which takes its cues from Akira Ifukube's themes, might not carry over into the next film. Altogether, these make the MonsterVerse more unpredictable and, to a Godzilla Godzilla fan, more exciting with the possibilities that come with each new entry. But for everywhere that Legendary's universe has gone since 2014, it never would have happened without Yoshimitsu Bano pushing Toho to take another chance after the Millennium Era came to a close. Thanks to his efforts, Bono and his fellow To The Max producers would be made executive producers on Godzilla 2014 and King of the Monsters, a long-delayed justification for the man who had dreamed of returning to Godzilla for decades. But Bono would never see King of the Monsters hit theaters, and would never realize his dream of creating another Hatera movie, as the director would pass away on May 7, 2017, at the age of 86. Yoshimitsu Bono's love of Godzilla is inextricable from the MonsterVerse and its ecological themes, and his passion for the King of the Monsters never died. With Bono once saying, the second message of the Godzilla series is the environmental problem. Although it brings many disasters, the nature in Japan is deep and rich. We're animistic, meaning we believe even inanimate objects may possess souls because we've lived with this rich nature and natural disaster so long, and we try to harmonize with nature. This way of thinking is more important than ever in a world world where our technology could kill us all in a massive war. I hope young filmmakers in Japan will make films which continue to spread this message. And finally, just like I did with my previous three Godzilla videos, here's my personal ranking of every MonsterVerse film, including Kong for this video only, from worst to best. At 4, Godzilla 2014, a solid start to the MonsterVerse and one that's actually better with rewatches. Edward's movie is a little more human than the average Godzilla film, and like every first movie in a Godzilla era, it's more serious. A lot of this movie is about discovering the nature of Godzilla, but the problem is that we're decades deep into Godzilla. Even the casual fans already know who he is. So because Edwards and company withhold Goji for so long, it's not mysterious, it's frustrating. Aaron Taylor Johnson's Ford isn't a compelling character, but Edwards makes sure to tie his camera work to the human perspective, making Godzilla and company tower over the frame and giving them a massive weight that emphasizes how overpowering their presence is. Even the very bland Mutos, they're a real wet blanket. Still, the spectacle and gravitas counterbalance the underwhelming structure of the story, which never regains its power once Brian Cranston, our emotional investment and conspiracy theory wife guy, suddenly dies. Now that I think about it, it's kind of 
about planes, trains, and automobiles. But instead of Steve Martin and John Candy, it's Aaron Taylor Johnson and Godzilla. At three, Kong Skull Island. The balance of a fresh approach to Kong mixed with the most tired Vietnam cliches imaginable makes this one a strange kaiju brew. But it's also weirdly refreshing in the world of modern blockbusters. Just about every character is some sort of stock archetype, but when you put them together with a really cool take on Skull Island, they don't feel quite so common. It's also incredibly well shot, with every set piece having its own distinct visual flair and threats that keep this a really fun treat to watch. Compared to most other blockbusters, Skull Island is also kind of cruel, but in a good way. Very willing to axe any character at any time, and using its very big supporting cast to consistently rack up the body count. Thankfully, Kong himself is given enough time and characterization to really let his personality come through, which is an absolute must when it comes to a Kong movie. If there's a major letdown, it's that the final fight between Kong and the big skull crawler isn't as interesting as what came before. And then the movie just kind of stops, not quite providing a full payoff for its discussions of the Vietnam War and soldiers being churned up by an indifferent government. At 2, Godzilla vs. Kong. Really, this movie is just a pure blast of fun. Compared to the previous entries, Godzilla vs. Kong is more like a title fight than a complex narrative. Of course, there's some human stories to work as connective tissue, with everything surrounding Kong a lot better than the Mechagodzilla conspiracy narrative. But what really works here is that Kong feels like the lead character of the movie with a complete arc. Thankfully, the amazing CGI means that Godzilla and Kong are fully formed, emotive creatures, whose feelings and motivations are evident in face and body language. As a big blow-off to some simmering plot threads, GVK is pure spectacle. There are, however, some missed opportunities to build out the world a little more in favor of being leaner and more focused on the two stars. By the end, you really know what these two titans want and how their outlooks change about each other. That's really impressive and fun, even when the bigger ideas of man's hubris incurring nature's wrath is somewhat fast-forwarded. And at number one, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. This is big, crazy, and ambitious in the ways I want from a modern Godzilla movie, especially when it comes to one that's from an American point of view. Admittedly, none of these Godzilla movies have the metaphorical meaning of the best Japanese films, but the monsterverse often traffics in ideas of global warming and nature gone wrong. After the much more muted Godzilla 2014, KOTM works as a bridge to a more Showa-inspired monster mash. The emotions are big, the human element is cartoony, and the monsters create global chaos that feels like a living storm. And of course, the fights here are fantastic. Moving Godzilla into pure CGI fundamentally changes the style and pacing of tokusatsu battle, but Doherty mixes spectacle with weight and personality. Ghidorah and Godzilla in particular have their own completely formed personalities that shine through their monster exteriors. It's all backed by Bear McCreary's fantastic score, which emphasizes the awe, terror, and wonder of every creature. In the end, this is a reckoning between humanity and nature run amok, with even the most well-equipped and enlightened people being forced to bow to ancient, overwhelming forces, or be lost. With American filmmakers finally getting their chance to bring Godzilla to life in their own successful franchise, it seemed as if Gojira had no need to return to Japan for the foreseeable future. But, like the loss and fears that gave life to him in the first place, the concurrent Tohoku tsunami and Fukushima nuclear disaster devastated Japan. Soon, Gojira would come home in a stranger, darker, timelier, and more important form than ever before. Thanks for watching today's video. This marks my fourth entry into my Godzilla film retrospective. And because of its subject matter, it's a hard break away from the previous three videos, which were intensely focused on Toho's Japanese production of Godzilla. Personally, it was the American Godzilla movies of years ago that originally got me to be aware of who Godzilla was and the appeal of him in general. But after years of watching Godzilla movies from Japan, American Godzilla movies and the MonsterVerse in particular actually feel like outliers to me now. Although I am a fan of these movies in general, I think they're very fun and are great examples of what modern block blockbusters can be. Obviously, I'm a big fan of King of the Monsters in particular, but I enjoy all of these movies. And although I was initially disappointed with Godzilla 2014 when I first saw it in theaters, rewatches over the years have made me appreciate it a lot more. 
And compared to a lot of modern blockbusters that are coming out these days, I think it's a pretty strong movie. I would love to hear your thoughts on the MonsterVerse, American Godzilla overall, and how you would rank these movies, including Kong Skull Island. Also, if you would like a King Kong retrospective in the future, let me know. With the close of this video, I think it's become clear that the finale to this series will be a video entirely focused on Shin Gojira, and it's something that I've been looking forward to doing for quite some time. As for how that will be shaped and how it will compare to the rest of these videos, well, you'll just have to wait and see. But one thing is guaranteed, that video will close with a ranking of every single Godzilla film, from every single era. As always, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only audio reviews. And until the next time, I hope that you're all taking care of yourselves, looking out for one another, and watching a lot of great Godzilla movies. They're good for the soul. See you again soon.